Am Items PowerPoint 3. Um, the previous audio was on microbial genetics part 2 and this one will be on viruses. Um, if I can speed this up a little bit maybe I can get prions on here as well. Okay so let's see what we can do. Um, and again folks these are just you know kind of superficial but hopefully just reminding of some vocabulary and some basic concepts. So remember viruses are trouble wrapped in protein. Um, so just a history of viruses, it wasn't until the late 1800s that the, um, like a good description of viruses was made by Dmitry Ivanovsky, a Russian scientist, who in studying the tobacco mosaic disease um, using um, porcelain filters determined that the pathogen causing tobacco mosaic disease was something smaller than a bacterium and thus he described the pathogens as filterable agents and then um, later Martinus Bajerink, a Dutch botanist, repeated Ivanowski's work and it was um, Bajerink that coined the term virus, um, virus coming from poison, but still you guys because the viruses are so little you can't see them with light microscopes, at least most viruses you can't see, see with light microscopes, so nobody really knew what a virus was. And then we said there was a great observation by a microbiologist involved in World War I when the, um, uh, the Allies cavalry experienced an outbreak of dysentery and so the microbiologist took some of the, the feces and plated it as you guys would and what he saw the next day was there were so many bacteria in the feces right it made a lawn of bacteria confluent growth but when he held the plate up to the light he saw that in that lawn of bacteria there were these holes which we now call plaques and so he made the observation that it looked like something had eaten the bacteria. That's what that's what was causing the holes of plaques, and thus um, and thus was coined the term bacteriophage for bacteria eaters, right? And it turns out now we now know that the bacteriophage there are viruses that infect and can kill bacteria. Um, and again, folks, it took the development of the electron microscope, so that was in the 1930s, I believe, in Germany, and then maybe late 1930s that we, um, um, in the U.S., had our first uh, electron mic microscope, and the first electron micrograph that was developed was of a bacteriophage. And again, you know, just the scientists were just blown away when the image appeared, right? Can you imagine? This is like some outer space alien, right? So... Um, um, once the electron microscope was developed, then it was a little bit easier to character, characterize at least you know the, the physical structure of the bacteriophage. So general characteristics of viruses, they're acellular, they're not made of cells, they can't synthesize the cell membrane, they lack ribosomes, um, they have to invade a host cell and have the host cell make all the proteins for it. They don't carry out metabolism. Again, they're they're called metabolic parasites, right? They can't make any of their ATP. They can't make anything for themselves. The host cell has to do it. For genetic information, they're going to have either DNA or, or RNA, but not both. And remember, you guys, cells have DNA and RNA. Viruses don't grow and divide, but they're assembled from parts like a car. And um, this this causes confusion on exams you guys. So all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites meaning they have to replicate inside a host cell. But you guys, um, being an obligate intracellular parasite doesn't automatically make you acellular because there's some cellular pathogens like some bacteria like rickettsia and chlamydia that are also obligate intracellular parasites and they're cellular. And any cellular organism can be infected with a virus. So the simplest virus, you guys, the, the trouble, <laughs> trouble is the genetic information, either DNA or RNA. Trouble wrapped in protein, so the, the protein shell is called the capsid, right? And the capsids can have different shapes. But what, an important job of the capsid is to protect the viral genetic information. And we'll see later, you guys, if this was a naked virus, meaning it lacks an envelope, another important um, function of the capsid is the adhesins would be located on the, on the capsid. And without adhesins, um, uh, viruses can't invade their host cells. So here's a, a nicer picture of the naked virus, you guys. So here's the, the capsid made out of these um, protein subunits called capsomeres. There can be different shapes, like we said. The um, viral genetic information is inside. Viral adhesins would be on the outside. And this was really important, you guys, because in general, naked viruses will, will remain infectious in the environment for longer periods of time. So as an example, you guys, like polioviruses, 
are naked viruses. Um, the papillomaviruses, the wart viruses, are, are naked viruses. And the reason is, is that this protein capsid is relatively tough, resistant, right? And that's where the protein adhesins are located. So as long as the, this outer surface isn't damaged, the viruses will remain infectious in the environment. In contrast, folks, remember that envelope viruses, um, they're going to steal um, membranes from their host cells. It could be the cytoplasmic membrane, the nuclear membrane, maybe the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi apparatus. So that stolen host cell membrane becomes the outermost layer of the virus, the, the viral envelope. And remember, you guys, the viruses have to modify that stolen host cell membrane. They at least have to stick some viral proteins, the adhesins, into the envelope, right? So again, in an envelope virus, the um, adhesins would be located in the envelope. And because the envelope, oops, let me back up here. And you guys, because the envelope, whole, um, stolen host cell membrane, remember fluid mosaic model? This is like an ocean of phospholipids, very delicate. So in general, we say that envelope viruses won't remain infectious in the environment as long as, say, a naked virus, because anything that damages, like even soap or alcohol or just drying up, might damage the um, envelope. Once the envelope's damaged, the adhesins can no longer function, and thus the virus is no longer infectious. And then, folks, we, we talked about how we can use the, um, the nucleic acid to help classify the viruses, and then we can use whether they're naked or enveloped to classify the viruses. So um, a naked DNA virus we discussed was a human papillomavirus. Remember, some strains can increase our risk for um, cervical cancer, cancer of the anus, um, rectum, penis, and the throat. A naked RNA virus is the polio virus, right, and fecal oral transmission. And do remember, you guys, that um, there's two polio vaccines. The SALK is the inactivated polio vaccine that cannot cause polio. And then the Sa Sabin, the oral polio vaccine, the Sabin vaccine, is a live attenuated polio virus. And sadly, it can revert to virulence and actually cause polio. And remember, you guys, that uh, live attenuated viral vaccines, you don't want to give them to the immunocompromised. And furthermore, after you vaccinate somebody with a live attenuated viral vaccines, you have to caution them that they'll be shedding vaccine virus for a few weeks. And thus, they have to be careful that they're not around somebody immunocompromised because they could accidentally transfer the attenuated um, vaccine virus to the immunocompromised person and their immune system might not be able to control it and it could cause great harm. Envelope DNA viruses, you guys, the herpes viruses, the... Um, uh, chickenpox shingles, varicella zoster viruses, a herpes virus, and then the human herpes virus type 1 and type 2 are herpes simplex viruses. Remember, um, folks, the herpes viruses are brilliant at causing latency. So the chickenpox virus, the, the human herpes virus type 1 and type 2, once they um, cause an initial infection in epithelial cells, then they invade the sensory um, neurons axon and they hang out in the sensory neurons until they're reactivated and they travel back down the sensory neuron axons and reinvade the epithelial cells causing reactivation, right? So um, a microbiology professor said herpes were like diamonds because diamonds are forever, right? So some of these herpes infections, once you've got them, you got them for the rest of your life. And then um, another envelope DNA virus is the hepatitis B virus. Luckily, you guys, we have a um, a hepatitis B vaccine. Um, I think they use genetic engineering, so it's not a live attenuated uh, virus vaccine. Um, and the good thing about the hepatitis B vaccine, you guys, is if we can prevent chronic hepatitis B infections, we will reduce um, we will reduce the number of folks suffering with liver cirrhosis um, or liver cancer. So we could say the hepatitis B vaccine is like an anti-liver cancer vaccine. So that's really cool. Well, back up here, guys. I apologize. Um, um, again, we're just kind of remembering our live attenuated viral vaccine. So the chickenpox vaccine, you guys, is, is a live attenuated vaccine. And I think the shingles vaccine is also. So again, just be really careful if you're vaccinated. Try to stay away for any, from anybody who's immunocompromised um, until the vaccine site heals up. Envelope RNA viruses, the, um, like I would say, you guys, the three to remember are the influenza viruses, 
right? And HIV and of course the SARS-CoV-2, the, um, the coronavirus is causing the current pandemic. Um, um, COVID-19. Um, and so you guys remember influenza virus and the pandemic coronavirus, they're both RNA viruses. They're both envelope viruses, right? And, and I, I think in the uh, viral presentation, we, we made some more parallels there. Um, remember you guys, RNA viruses, because RNA polymerase is copying the viral RNA. We're going to have a lot more mistakes. So these RNA viruses have the potential for much higher mutation rates. That's one reason why the influenza virus, one reason we have to get new influenza um, vaccines every year is from the antigenic drift. All those mutations start building up in the H and N antigens. Um, the high mistake rate is another reason why we haven't been able to develop a successful HIV vaccine. And it might be, folks, if we do get the COVID-19 vaccine, it might be a lot like the influenza vaccine where we might have to develop new COVID-19 vaccines every year if we get a lot of mutation going on. And again, you guys, naked viruses are going to remain infectious in the environment for longer periods of time. Um, in general, the envelope viruses won't remain infectious for as long outside of their host because damage to the envelope means that the adhesins can no longer work. Okay, I'm just going to pause this really quickly, guys, because, again, I have animals wandering in and out of the room. So let me just close the door again. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry folks about the delay. Okay, all right. Okay, and then folks, um, we went through bacteriophage replication. So remember, lytic bacteriophage can, like the, the T bacteriophage, they can only carry out the lytic cycle, right? And um, so this is actually a cartoon, you guys, of the temperate phage, the temperate bacteriophage lambda. But just to go through it really quick, you guys, so in the lytic cycle, there's attachment or absorption we have entry of the viral genetic information into the bacterium. And then the viral genetic information is transcribed and translated. We end up breaking up the bacterial chromosome. The nucleotides will be used to make copies of the phage DNA. The phage mRNA that's been transcribed by the bacterial RNA polymerase will be translated by the bacterial ribosomes. So we have synthesis, um, biosynthesis of the phage nucleic acid and proteins and then we have self-assembly right the proteins assemble into the heads and the tails and before the tails um, attach themselves to the heads the capsids the capsids will package um, little pieces of DNA and occasionally there might be some bacterial chromosomal DNA that gets packaged like if that was specialized transduction then um, we have assembly right and then the phage release like a lysozyme like substance and they they lyse the host. So in the lytic cycle, the host bacterium always dies and you get release of newly replicated viruses. So the lytic um, bacteriophage, like the T-even phage, they can only do lytic. But in contrast, what we see here is actually a temperate bacteriophage and the classic one is lambda. And you can see here, folks, that lambda has a choice. It can either go lytic or it can go lysogenic. So let's do the lysogenic cycle, you guys. So the first two steps are the same. So we have attachment or absorption and then entry where the nucleic acid is introduced. But in the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA um, inserts itself into the bacterial chromosome. It, there's these hot spots. So the phage DNA in the chromosome is called the prophage, right? And as far as the bacterium is concerned, the prophage is part of the chromosome. So when the bacterium is ready, the lysogenized bacterium carrying the prophage is ready to... Um, 
undergo binary fission, when it copies its chromosome, it copies the prophage. So the prophage can be passed down generation after generation after generation, right? But if there's any kind of DNA damage, that will trigger a series of events um, that will cause what's what we term induction. And induction is when the phage is going to switch from the lysogenic cycle back to the lytic cycle, right? And you and it's usually from the DNA damage, a phage repressor protein that's keeping the phage in the lysogenic cycle is destroyed. So that's what triggers the phage to go back to the lytic cycle. So the bacteriophage cuts itself out of the bacterial chromosome, right? And then that becomes a template for biosynthesis and transcription, and then we enter the lytic cycle. So the result of induction is um, the bacterium is going to die, the phage will be replicated, and also you guys in induction, this is essential for specialized transduction. So remember, specialized transduction, you need both the lysogenic cycle and the lytic cycle. For generalized transduction, all you need is a lytic cycle. Okay. And again, generalized transduction, you guys, this is just when by accident some of the bacterial donor DNA gets packaged into the phage heads, right? And then when, when that phage is released, it can still infect a neighboring bacterium and inject the donor DNA into the recipient uh, bacterium. And through homologous recombination, it can get inserted into the recipient's chromosome. So any piece of donor DNA can be transferred, thus generalized transduction. Um, and again, folks, just remember in specialized transduction, it requires both a lysogenic cycle and a lytic cycle, and only special donor genes can be transferred to the recipient. So a lot of our understanding of bacteriophage replication was um, much faster than our understanding of animal virus replication, because remember, you guys, we can't grow viruses on auger plates, right? You have to have cells present. So um, in the old, old days, the only way they knew how to do that was actually to inject um, animals. And of course, there's ethical and moral issues there. Um, it was discovered that you know, some viruses, not all, can grow in embryonated eggs, right? And then in the 50s, they had this breakthrough, a new technique of actually growing monolayers of cells in cell culture, tissue culture, right? And then you could... Um, in fact, those monolayers of cells with your viruses, okay, and again, not all not all viruses can grow in um, cell or tissue culture, but a lot more can grow in cell and tissue culture than can grow in eggs. Um, but you'll remember the problem was the um, the cells, they can only replicate so many times and then they die out. So they were looking for an immortalized cell line. Oops, and here's the embryonated eggs, and here's a, a cell tissue culture. Um, in the old days, we had these hard, sterile um, tissue culture plates, and, and this is something new. <laughs> I'm a dinosaur, right? But they have these flexible bags, and they have ports, so you can introduce viruses or antiviral um, drug candidates and see if you can inhibit the, um, the virus replication. And then, folks, you know, this heartbreaking story, the immortal life of Henry of the Lax, um, um, the HeLa cells, as they became known, were cervical cancer cells from Henrietta Lacks. She died soon after they were harvested. And these cells were immortal cells. They kept dividing and dividing and dividing. And we know that's a problem with cancer cells. And it was discovered later, somebody got the Nobel Prize for this, that um, the human papillomavirus strain 18, its genetic information had been inserted into the cerv cervical cancer chromosomes. So it was this viral genetic information that had caused the cells to become cancerous. And um, again, the, the, the heartbreak of this was that, you know, um, Mrs. Lax wasn't asked permission, her family wasn't asked permission. Um, so a lot of ethical issues here. And, and th this to me, you guys, is why journalism is so important because, you know, this story may, may not have been revealed until a jur journalist, you know, went and figured out what had happened. And, um, you know, it's so important, history, we need to study history to learn our mistakes so we won't make the same mistakes later, right? So the HeLa cells in um, immortalized cell line, they just keep dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. And many studies like with HIV and polio and antiviral drugs have been, um, have, have used the HeLa cells. Um, viral entry um, have three ways. So always, you guys, step one is, I should back up you guys, step one is always the virus has to attach 
to the surface of its host cell and the viral adhesins have to bind to complementary host cell surface receptor so absorption is always step one right and then animal viruses have three strategies this is a lot like bacteriophage gaze where the the um, capsid remains on the outside of the host cell and then and then um, special viral proteins will form a pore in the host cell membrane and then the viral genetic information enters this way and my understanding is this is how poliovirus gets its genetic information in our cells and then with HIV um, HIV uses a fusion technique so the HIV envelope remember is just stolen host cell membrane the HIV envelope um, where the adhesins are located again the adhesins bind to the host cell surface molecules and then there's another envelope protein in HIV that triggers fusion of the HIV envelope with the cell membrane and remember this is just like olive oil right and then once fusion is accomplished the HIV capsid is released inside our cells and then the capsid the capsomeres are disassembled and that releases the HIV and then HIV reverse transcriptase makes a DNA copy of the HIV that gets inserted into our chromosomes and then um, endocytosis here folks so for example influenza viruses herpes viruses um, it, it, again this would involve um, uh, envelope envelope viruses so they bind the viral adhesins in the envelope bind to host cell surface receptors that triggers a host cell um, to undergo um, to perform endocytosis brings in the virus in a membrane bound vesicle kind of like a phagosome or an endosome and then envelope proteins trigger fusion of the viral envelope with the endosome membrane and again release of, of the capsid disassembly of the capsomeres and that releases the viral genetic information um, oops let me just back up here and you get again you guys um, remember we said neutralizing antibodies are so powerful neutralizing antibodies will bind to the viral adhesins and then block the ability of the virus to bind to our cells if you can block attachment you block infection right and that's why neutralizing antibodies are so powerful ideally for example if we got a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine it would trigger neutralizing antibodies against the um, pandemic corona coronavirus S protein on the envelope which is the um, adhesin that binds to our ACE2 receptors which are located in our lungs and unfortunately in other tissues as well so um, we want to remember that RNA viruses have special challenges because remember if you're an RNA virus you need to make copies of your RNA and you guys remember cellular RNA polymerase cellular RNA polymerases use DNA as a template to make complementary RNA right so we call it DNA dependent RNA polymerase what a virus needs is an RNA dependent RNA polymerase meaning that RNA is used as a template to make complementary RNA our cells don't make RNA dependent RNA polymerases therefore the virus has to bring along the genetic information uh, for synthesis of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and again you guys this is just another um, the retroviruses for example HIV they take this even to the ne next wild degree remember in the first step of the HIV reverse transcription they use the HIV RNA as a template to make complementary DNA right so that's an, an RNA dependent DNA polymerase and in the second step, you need not know this, you guys, it's so crazy. The reverse transcriptase then uses that DNA as a template to make complementary DNA. I, how that's possible is beyond me. It's just mind-blowing. Mind oh, and here's, here's just the cartoon, you guys, on um, neutralizing antibodies. So here's our virus. Here are the adhesins. Neutralizing antibodies bind to the adhesins, so then the adhesins can't bind to the host cells. The virus can't bind, so there's no infection, right? And we can also have, you guys, neutralizing antibodies against exotoxins. Right, so for example, the anti antitoxins, the antibodies against the toxins, um, neutralization would be a powerful strategy. If the exotoxin can't bind to our cells, it can't get in, and therefore no damage is in. And also, you guys, um, with any pathogen that needs to attach to our cells, we can have neutralizing antibodies that can block um, attachment. And again, folks, this is this is a big goal of many of our vaccines. Um, when we, when we vaccinate our kids ourselves, we want to try to uh, trigger production of those neutralizing antibodies to block infection. Um, with regard to um, antiviral drugs, you know it's it's tough, man, treating viral infections because remember the viruses are using our cells' biosynthetic machinery 
um, to replicate, right? So the problem is sometimes in stopping viral replication, you're shutting down your own cells biosynthetic capability and that can cause some serious side effects. Um, and other problem is the viruses are replicating inside our cells. So you have to get, it's sometimes hard to get a high enough therapeutic uh, concentration of the antiviral drugs inside of our cells. Um, we did talk about um, nucleotide, um, nucleotide nucleoside or base analogs and one one you guys this was the first one that came out to help people infect with HIV was called AZT azitothymidine so these are look-alike um, nucleosides nucleotide or bases so um, AZT is going to target the HIV reverse transcriptase right to block that step one in um, HIV using its RNA to make um, a DNA copy of its genetic information. We're going to block production of the HIV provirus. Um, we mentioned, you guys, that some viruses can cause latent infections. So in a latent infection, um, you have the primary infection when you first get infected, and very often you have clinical signs and symptoms, and then you seem to recover. And so you think, oh, I'm not infected anymore. But what these latent viruses do is they're hiding out in places in our body they're not actively replicating, but they're they're resting, they're waiting, right? And then um, maybe years later, there'll be some trigger which reactivates these, we could call them dormant infections, and then the viruses start replicating again, and we can have a whole nother round of clinical signs and symptoms. It's not a new infection, it's a reactivation of these latent infections. And the 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 champions at latent infections, you guys, are the herpes viruses, so that the chickenpox, when we first first are infected with a varicella zoster virus. The initial infection, primary infection, is called chickenpox. It invades our sensory neurons, hangs out there until sometime when we're under a lot of stress or maybe as we age our immune system starts to fail us. And then the varicella zoster reactivates and we have another round of clinical signs and symptoms called shingles, right? Um, and we have a vaccine for chickenpox, you guys, and there's also a vaccine for those of us who had chickenpox as kids that can help reduce the severity of reactivation. So there's also shingles vaccine. Remember, they're attenuated light virus, so be careful um, immunizing immunocompromised folks. And if you are vaccinated, be careful. You'll be shedding um, vaccine virus, so you don't want to get around anybody else who's immunocompromised. And then also, folks, the in the old days, these, these were called the herpes simplex viruses. Now they're called the human herpes virus type 1 and type 2. These are also notorious for causing latent infections. Um, both of these groups of herpes virus, they invade the sensory neurons and they're just resting, lying dormant in our sensory neurons until they're reactivated. And then they travel back down the sensory neuron um, axons and reinvade um, epithelial cells and cause reactivation. Um, human papillomavirus, HPV, the wart viruses can cause latent infections, as can um, HIV. And remember, you guys, with HIV, through the... Um, through reverse transcriptase, it makes a double-stranded DNA copy of the HIV genetic information that gets inserted into our chromosome. Again, you guys, um, human herpes virus type 1 usually causing infections above the belt. Human herpes virus type 2 usually causing infections below the belt. But remember, viruses don't read textbooks, so we can switch places. Um, and we just said, you know, there's great concern, like if you're in dentistry, if your fingers get infected from working on a, a person shedding herpes virus in the mouth, then you, again, become latently infected. And these are really painful infections here. Real common place, you guys, for reactivation is the mouth. So some, some people call them cold sores, right, when they reactivate and we're shedding infectious virus there. A huge concern is if we have infection of the eye because reactivation can actually damage the eye and cause blindness. With um, genital herpes, it's it's a huge concern when people are being intimate, right? That would be one way for the genital herpes to be transferred. And it's also a huge concern if we have a pregnant mom and she, for the first time, gets infected with genital herpes late in pregnancy. Then the concern is if she has a vaginal delivery, if she's shedding virus, then her baby, who's being born through the um, vaginal canal, will get infected with the herpes viruses. And the baby's, their immune system isn't developed yet, right? And if mom hasn't had a chance to develop um, IgG antibodies against the herpes virus, the, the baby is, is basically just 
almost has no protection against a herpes virus. So then we really worry about neonatal um, herpes. Um, and again, folks, this was, I, I just really want to stress, you know, when you're giving vaccines or, or if you're receiving a vaccine, you know, try to find out, isn't it, is it, if it's a viral vaccine, is it an attenuated live virus vaccine, right? Because um, even if you're not immunocompromised, after receiving the attenuated live virus vaccine, remember you may be shedding vaccine virus for several days, maybe a couple of weeks. So you need to be really careful who you come in contact with because you could transfer the um, the vaccine virus to somebody who is immunocompromised, right? And we just went over here some of the examples of severe immunodeficiencies. Um, we'd want to be careful um, giving the live attenuated viral vaccines and um, and then I think this is I think this is the last bit on the viral intro, you guys. Um, it's thought that some of these latent viruses may increase our risk for certain types of cancer. You'll recall with Henrietta Lacks, her, the cervical cancer cells, it was the HPV strain 18 DNA was inserted into the cervical um, cancer cell chromosomes, right? So some of these um, viral, the viral genetic information in some cases may actually increase the risk of cancer. So we, we know with HPV strains 16 and 18, those um, strains can increase our risk for cervical cancer, cancer of the penis, the anus, the rectum, and also the throat. Um, and, and the good news is, you guys, we have vaccines to protect us against HPV strains 16 and 18. So we can say, you know, those are anti-cancer vaccines. Likewise, we, um, likewise, folks, we have a vaccine against hepatitis B virus, and um, that should protect us against chronic hep B infections that should reduce the incidence of liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. Yeah, so here we go. These are some of the, the oncogenic means cancer-causing viruses, you guys. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus, and it too can greatly increase the risk for um, liver cancer. They have... I. I I need to do more research on this, you guys. I think the UCD Med Center helped develop antiviral therapy where they've actually been able to cure some people with hepatitis C um, infections, but it's very expensive. And, and if I remember correctly, it's really hard on the patients. Remember we said lots of times the antiviral drugs are really hard on the patients. So we don't have a, it would be great if we could, if we could develop a hepatitis C vaccine. And then we have the HPV vaccines against strain 16 and 18. Um, we don't have an Epstein-Barr uh, vaccine yet. You guys, this causes Burkitt's lymphoma, nasal pharyngeal cancer. Um, I, I remember this virus is causing infectious mononucleosis, so it'd be great if we could get a vaccine against that one too. Okay, and these are the anti-cancer vaccines against oncogenic viruses. And then, folks, um, let me see if I can't blast through the prions really quick, and then we'll finish this audio, and then I'll do one more on medical microbiology, and then that will do it for the review ones. I didn't make a, a new PowerPoint, you guys, on um, immunology. That was our last unit, and I thought I'd basically just be repeating the audio that I'd already made. So, okay, let's see, you guys, if we can blast through disease-causing prions. So disease-causing prions, these are abnormally folded cellular um, proteins. It's supposed to stand for proteinaceous infectious particles. They're acellular. They lack nucleic acid. Um, again, they're abnormally folded. So you guys remember that if you look at a good normal cellular prion and compare it to the misfolded disease-causing prion, the primary level protein structure, the specific amino acid sequence would be the same, but secondary structure tertiary structure and quaternary structure are going to differ, right? So when the prions misfold, they become really, really hard to denature, right? So we want to remember that the disease-causing prions, if, um, if, if they contaminate surgical instruments and the instruments are autoclave, normal autoclaving won't destroy the misfolded prions. So those autoclave surgical instruments could transfer the disease-causing prions to the next patient. That's kind of a nightmare in hospitals. Right? So the misfolded prions, they cause a family of diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or TSEs. There's no treatment, right? There's no vaccine. There's no treatment. 100% fatal. And furthermore, you guys, um, remember, our immune system doesn't recognize the misfolded prions as being foreign. So there's no immune response. There's no antibody response. 
So we don't have an easy test to determine if a person or an animal is incubating a prion disease, right? That's, oh, we need, a, it would be awesome to have a great blood test. So when the prions misfold, we say they acquire that, that quaternary level of structure. They start stacking on one, one another, forming filaments. And what we'll see in the brains of um, animals or people that die of TSCs, we see literally these holes in the brain that those tangled masses of misfolded prions cause. So Kuru, amongst the Fori people, Papua New Guinea, uh, transmitted by mortuary cannibalism, these holes, the classic kind of spontaneous form of um, prion disease in old, old us old folks, classic Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, the holes. And this is the prion disease of goats and sheep scraping. And again, these massive holes in here, just horrible. Okay, and so there's a lack of immune response, so there's not a, a quick and easy blood test, which we really need. Um, and again, folks, the history, the earliest record of a prion disease at the time, they didn't know it was a prion disease, but in 1700, scrapey um, in Britain, in sheep and goats. So it might be they have this sensation of an incurable itch, so they keep scra scraping themselves along a surface until they bleed. Um, another problem might be if um, the, the cerebellum might be involved and they might be off balance. So that's another reason why they're walking along, say, a, a fence or the side of a building so they don't fall over and that would contribute to the the damage to the skin and then they're bleeding and then we know the disease causing prions are found in blood so then that surface becomes contaminated and a healthy animal could come along and conceivably could infect themselves. And then 20s, Kreutzfeldt Jacobs described this fatal neurological disease and nobody knew what was causing this, right? And then in the 50s, the 40 people, Papua New Guinea, and the horrible disease Kuru that was killing so many of the children and the women. And then it was later proposed that, um, Stanley Prisoner proposed that these were these misfolded cellular prion proteins that lack nucleic acid and everybody laughed at him and turned out he was right and he won the Nobel Prize for it. And this again, you guys, is the heartache with the misfolded prions. They're so resistant to destruction. So cooking, like if you had um, uh, beef with BSE, um, prions in them. If you cook the meat really well, that won't destroy the prions. So cooking, heating, boiling won't do it. They're not inactivated by normal autoclaving. Um, the prions are present because they're associated with, with neurons. Of, they are a highest concentration, of course, in the brain and spinal cord, but neurons innervate muscle, right? So it's going to be present in meat. And also in the ingestive form, the prions are found on white blood cells and in lymphoid tissues. So you, like we said, UV won't inactivate them, normal autoclaving won't inactivate them. They, and again, you guys, um, I, I think there's been documentation of transfer of prion diseases in blood donations. And of course, tissue and organ transplants. And again, this is the problem, you guys, because if you're um, having, doing surgery on a person that's incubating the prion disease, you don't know, you know, that they are prion positive. Or if someone dies and are a tissue or organ donor, right, and you don't know they have the prion disease, the donated tissues and organs um, can carry the prions to the to the recipient. So we can destroy prions with incineration. And also you guys in the original PowerPoint slide you'll remember there there are um, protocols where by soaking in bleach or, or soaking in sodium hydroxide and then autoclaving for an hour um, you can destroy the misfolded prions, but the problem is a lot of medical equipment, surgical instruments, um, medical equipment that gets reused, it, it can't survive that kind of treatment, right? So it would be awesome if, um, like here in the European Union, I don't think this is approved in the United States, they have special enzymes that will help to remove harmful prions from medical instruments, but I don't think that's approved here in the United States. And again, folks, this is the story of how humans were essential in the evolution of bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So um, ruminants like cows, sheep, and goats um, are plant eaters, right? They're herbivores. But when we are, um, we are raising um, cattle and sheep for meat, um, and maybe you've got a big operation going on, um, one of the big expenses is your feed. So you're going to look for feed that has a, like a lower economical protein source. And so um, an economical source of protein for cattle feed was this um, processed animal products. Um, and I'll just call it blood and bone meal here. 
So dead animals that died on the farm or sick animals um, can't go for human food. So they're going to get they're going to get um, salvaged, right? And parts of the animals that people won't eat, it all goes for salvage, so it gets cooked up. And remember, you guys, cooking doesn't destroy the disease-causing prion. So we think what happened was that sheep and goats that had the scrapey prion were made into this protein animal supplement that got added to the cattle feed. So when the cattle ate the scrapey prions, the scrapey prions bound to the cattle prions and caused them to misfold. And that's how we ended up with mad cow disease. And then, of course, the even bigger tragedy was then when humans ate meat from the cattle with the BSE um, prion, the BSE prion bound to the humans' good normal, normal cellular prions and caused them to misfold. And that's how the variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease um, evolved. And, it, and, it, and again, folks, that hits young people, like your ages, you know, teens and 20s. Um, just heartbreaking. So... These prions can jump hosts, it seems like, pretty easily, and that's very disturbing. So, and again, folks, this is a story. So we think the scrapey prion jumped into cattle, bound to the cattle prions, triggered the BSE, misfolded BSE prions. Humans ate cattle with BSE, and the BSE um, prion bound to the human prion triggered them to misfold. We ended up with a variant creutzfeldt jakobs disease. And we do want to remember, you guys, that... Um, we have our own um, homegrown prion disease of elk, um, deer, and moose, and it's called chronic wasting disease. And there's huge concern, you know, if if you eat um, venison, deer meat, or elk, say, from a CWD prion positive animal, could the chronic wasting disease prion jump directly into humans, causing another new form of variant creutzfeldt jakobs disease, or could the chronic wasting disease prion jump into cattle that graze the same um, the same pasture or grasslands, and then we end up with our own North American um, variant of of BSE? And then again, if we humans were to eat um, beef from this new North American variant of BSE, then could we develop a, like a third form of variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease? Okay, and you guys, I think I'll stop here, um, and maybe I'll take a little bit of a little break. I'm I'm getting a little bit raspy here, right? So, you guys, so if I don't get this last part up tonight, um, I will get it up. I'll try to do it. Um, well, tomorrow morning I'm giving makeup exams, and I, I like to be online while people are taking their exams, so if problems come up. So, hopefully, you guys, I can get this the last part, the medical micro part, up maybe by tomorrow afternoon. And hopefully, this part, you guys, hopefully is still fresh in your mind because we, we just had our exam on this. And again, folks, I, I won't do a review on immunology because it would be just basically the same <laughs> the same audio that I already recorded. Okay. All right, you guys. So um, hopefully there will be one more section here. And um, yeah, you guys, just try, if you can, try to get a good night's sleep before the final. Try to make sure you eat something right because it's like a two-hour final, and you're going to be making and burning a lot of ATP. So try to get some sleep and try to eat, and that will help you do better on, on the final exam. Okay, you guys.